Hey everyone. Whirly Gig by Paul Fleischman. We are on chapter three. And last week we were in Weeksboro, Maine, where Alexandra and Stephanie otherwise known as Steph, found a whirly gig. And they uh, did a visualization for Steph, whom Alexandra thought should have a boyfriend, that it was time for her to have a boyfriend. So they sat in the snow in Maine in the winter in front of this whirly gig and visualized the perfect boyfriend for Stephanie. So I'm going to wait just a minute. It's been a day here in Middle Tennessee. Um, the corn across the street from me is turning brown, which means it's almost time for harvest. I'm going to be very excited to be able to watch them harvest the corn this year. That's going to be so cool. I've never actually seen anybody harvest corn. And um, we were driving down the street today and... Um, the cotton fields are, two weeks ago, we were driving by, and it was just the little yellow flowers that the cotton puts out before the bowls, before the cotton bowls. And um, today, the fields are white with cotton, so pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. The title of this chapter is After Life. Now, in the first chapter, if you'll remember, we left uh, Brent and he was um, he was in his car drifting to the left. He felt his hands jerk, but he kept them on his thighs. And, it, and in his mind, he kept hearing, you have the power to end your life now. Very slowly, he closed his eyes. And he didn't put his hands back on the steering wheel. So, okay. So now we are back. We've left the two girls and we're back with Brent. So here we go. And this actually is one of the pivotal chapters in the book where we learn a lot of information that happened after Brent let go of the steering wheel. So here we go. The afterlife. The day's first squirt of sunlight hit the window. The bus changed to gears. Brent opened his eyes. They were climbing through mountains now. The other passengers around him were sleeping. Twitched alert by the light, he craned his neck to get a better view, pressed his head to the tinted glass, and raptly observed the sun's rising. After night came another day. And after, after death, another life. Mornings seemed mysterious gifts. He inspected the dawn with fascination. The bus's gears growled. Behind him, he heard a faint conversation in another language. This is the afterlife, he told himself. To be crowded in with a collection of strangers, plunging through a foreign landscape, headed toward an unknown destiny. The bus was his ferry across the river, across the river Styx. It descended now into an unlit valley. Brent squinted at his map and realized he was in the Cascades. Seattle wasn't far off. He'd been riding for two days, watching new souls board in Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Fargo, Bozeman, Butte, Kurdaline, Spokane. He'd speculated on their previous lives. 
he had surprisingly little interest in his own. His second life had eclipsed his first. Its moment of birth had been the crash. He didn't remember the actual impact. He did recall the ambulance lights, the policeman asking how he felt, the discovery that he'd escaped with only cuts and a minor head injury. Then came the alcohol test. Then the drive to the police station being booked for drunk driving the photographs and fingerprints, registering his new birth, he thought now. Then the realization that the ambulance at the scene had been tending someone else, that he'd hit another car. His father had arrived at the station. There was talk of the Chevy, its back end mangled, the car probably totaled. Then the news delivered by one of the officers that the woman he'd hit had died. The muteness had begun in that moment. He spoke not at all driving home with his father, slept 14 hours and didn't speak the next day. Hi, Sandy. He remembered the party and he tried to kill himself. Then he'd ended up killing someone else, left him frozen. Oh. That he'd ended up killing someone else left him frozen, numb from scalp to soles. Words returned on the second day. His turmoil, though, was translatable, wasn't translatable into words. So, Sandy, I'm going to catch you up. We're back to Brent, who was going to kill himself in his car. So now we're back to Brent. He didn't die. His mother got rid of the newspaper that had a story about the crash, but Brent dug it out of the bottom of the trash can. His car had apparently hit the divider, spun, then been struck by the driver behind him. His blood alcohol was 0.11. The story was brief and gave only the victim's name, age, and residence. Leia Samora, 18, Chicago. He plumbed those few facts. She was nearly his own age. He was determined to know more. He tried the obituaries, but her name wasn't listed. He rummaged through the trash for the following day's paper, turned to the gravy-stained ob obituaries, and found her. Daughter of Cesar and Tamara Samora senior at Niles North High School, an honor student, member of the student council, the orchestra, the track team, active in the Filipino community, volunteer at Resurrection Hospital. Why did he have to kill someone like that? Then he realized with a surge of relief that he could perhaps go to the funeral the police had confiscated his license, but he could take a cab, stand in the back, leave an anonymous offering of some kind. He checked the paper. It had been held the day before. He ate little, spoke little, and no longer listened to music. He turned 17, an event he scarcely noticed. He heard his parents whisper about the blow to his head and his personality change. He'd been diagnosed with a mild concussion. The headaches, like a wrecking ball working on his skull, came less often, replaced by the endless tolling in his mind of the word murderer. Everyone knew. He refused to go to school and made arrangements to finish his classwork at home. He disliked being seen in the neighborhood where the glances he drew were too long or too short. Among strangers, he felt no less an outcast, their blind assumption that he was one of them making him wince inside. He studied their carefree innocence with envy, an old woman reading on a bench in a mall, a baby sleeping in a stroller, a pretzel seller joking with a customer. 
He was no longer of their kind and never would be. There was a hearing with a judge soon after the crash. Like a ghost, Brent listened to other people discuss the incident, accident and his fate. He was charged with DUI and manslaughter. He hadn't contested his guilt. His punishment was the issue at hand. The judge asked for more information and set a date for a second hearing. It was then that the invest interviewing began. Social workers and psychologists questioned him, his parents and his friends. He found the fact that he tried to kill himself impossible to share with another soul. He could scarcely believe he'd actually tried it and wondered how he could have given no thought to the other cars he would hit. His parents hired their own lawyer and a psychologist. Their job was to argue that sending him to the juvenile detention center would be detrimental to his worrisome mental state. His father tried to cheer him up, promising he would serve no time, telling him to put it behind him assuring him people would forget. I won't, Brent answered silently. He took the obituary from his hiding place, looked up Cesar Samora in the phone book, and spent all of one day composing what became a four-sentence apology. He mailed it on a Monday. The reply came on Friday. An envelope with his own letter inside mutilated with scissors, stabbed, defaced with cigarette burns. Nightmares about Mr. Samora stalking him through the Philippine jungle joined those about the detention center. Entering the courthouse for a second hearing, the latest dream of being beaten by a circle of inmates recurred to him. He passed a young man, his arms swarming with tattoos, whom he'd was certain he'd seen in the dream. He and his parents found their own their room. The psychologist spoke, then the lawyers. Brent suddenly wondered if Mr. Samora might be there. He was trying to scan the faces to his rear when his father squeezed his forearm. The judge was addressing him, sentencing him to probation in place of the detention center. His parents beamed. He felt relief, but also an unanswered hunger. He realized he wanted a punishment. Brent knew also that, grim as the dissension center might be, he'd have welcomed the chance to leave his family and his previous life behind. The listing of the terms of his probation hardly registered with him, alcohol counseling, therapy for depression, volunteering in an emergency room. Then the judge came to the final item, meeting with the victim's family if they desired to discuss restitution. Brent knew the meeting would never take place, an outcome that once again left him both relieved and unsatisfied. He wanted to do something for the family. Two days later, the probation officer called. The victim's mother had agreed to talk with him. The meeting was scheduled in a building downtown. Entering, Brent wished his parents weren't with him. The room was spacious and had a view of Lake Michigan. Miss Gill, young and black and soft voiced, was there to serve as mediator. A few minutes later, Mrs. Zamora arrived, not the tiny Asian woman Brent had pictured, but a heavy set redhead in an India print skirt. Among the dozen necklaces jangling on her chest, Brent picked out pendants of an astrological sign and a Native American sun symbol. Her wavy hair flowed exuberantly over her shoulders. The rest of her seemed only half alive. She navigated the introductions with an eerie, ethereal calm. Brent gazed openly into her face, 
offering himself up to her and noticed that her eyes were slightly bloodshot. Those eyes searched his own, then released him. How strange, he thought, that he'd somehow caused this woman, whom he'd never met, to cry. We are meeting today, said Miss Gill, to apologize and to understand and to atone. Her voice was hopeful rather than accusing. We never know all the consequences of our acts. They reach into places we can't see and into the future where no one can. She looked at Brent, then invited Mrs. Samora to describe the results of <laughs> Leah's death. When the phone rang, she began, I was sorting through lentils to soak for soup the next day. Her voice had a faint flutter to it. Eyes down, she continued her detailed, dispassionate account of that night and the days that followed, of her husband's smashing a wooden chair in his rage, the younger children's endless crying, her sleeplessness, the thought of killing herself to be with Leah, the voice from Leah's phone saying, no. Brent closed his eyes. What murderous machine had be, he constructed and set in motion? When his turn finally came to speak, the long apology he'd rehearsed reduced itself to the two words, I'm sorry. Words he spoke over and over, then wailed miserably through tears, not caring that his parents were watching. Miss Gill spoke for a while. When it came time to discuss restitution, Brent saw his father shift nervously. The Samoras hadn't sued. Apparently, they were content with the insurance company's payment. His father had brought his checkbook just in case. Brent spied the silver pin beside it in his jacket's inside pocket, stationed like a butler awaiting command. Miss Gill reviewed various possibilities. A written apology to each family member. Service to a charity of the Samoras' choice. Service to the Samoras themselves. Whatever it might be would have to be would have to be agreeable to both parties. Mrs. Samora stared back at her. I don't believe in retribution. Leah was born in the Philippines. I was teaching English and I met my husband there. I saw what an eye for an eye looks like with the rebels fighting the government and all that. My husband feels a little differently. I also believe everything happens for a reason. She toyed with her necklaces. That the universe required this for some reason. She paused, then directed her words at Brent's parents. They had a very caring soul, very strong and generous. Everybody who saw her smiled. They loved her at the hospital where she worked. This summer, she was going to do volunteer work in California. In the fall, she was going to college in Boston. She would have spread joy all over the country. Brent wondered what his own eulogy would sound like. Mrs. Zamora turned her gaze on him. I've thought about you for hours and hours. What can you possibly do for me? Paint a house? Mow the lawn all summer? Her voice had acquired a stronger tremble. She let the questions hang in the air, then looked to Brent's left out the window. My father is a very fine carpenter. Leah was his first grandchild. When she was little, he made her lots of wooden toys. Her favorite was a whirligig, of a girl with arms that spin in the wind. He painted the face to look like her. We've had it on a pole in our yard forever. 
Hundreds of people over the years have noticed it and it stopped and smiled. Just like people smiled <coughs> at Leah. She opened her purse, extracted a photo, looked at it, and passed it to Brent. It showed the wind toy in motion. Leah is gone. I'm learning to accept that. I thought I had nothing I could ask you that would help. You can't bring back her body. Then I thought about her spirit. Brent's skin tingled. He stared at the photo, then at her, anxious to hear her bidding. This is my only request, that you make four whirly gigs of a girl that looks like Leia. Put her name on them, then set them up in Washington, California, Florida, and Maine, the corners of the United States. Let people all over the country receive joy from her, even though she's gone. You make the smiles that she would have made. It's the only thing you can do for me. That's what I ask. You must be joking, said Brent's mother. His father strained forward in his chair. This is crazy, he appealed to Miss Gill. That's not the kind of thing you ask for, he faced Mrs. Samora. And how's he supposed to zip around the country in his private jet? She pulled something else out of her purse. I bought him a Greyhound bus pass. Good for 45 days. He can go anywhere. Miss Gill repeated that restitutions weren't imposed, but accepted voluntarily by the offender. Brent's parents raised one objection after another from his commitment to the emergency room to his need for his family his non-existent carpentry skills, and the cruel and unusual conditions of bus travel. Brent was oblivious of the arguing. In the quiet storm cellar of his mind, he pondered the proposal. Strange as it was, it would get him away from Chicago, his parents, and his recent past. It would also give him a chance to do penance. He'd never traveled on his own before, the idea held sudden appeal. He smiled and sighed. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> then he spoke the words. I'll do it. The bus sped down the cascades like a skier. Then the road flattened. Brent saw a man point. He turned and beheld a peak in the distance that seemed a mirage impossibly high snow shimmering on its wide shoulders, the absolute lord of the landscape. The word Rainier passed down the aisle. Brent gawked. It seemed too large, as a full moon does when it first rises into view. He'd never been west of Chicago before. He was sure he was there now. He opened his whirligig book and looked through it between glances out the window. He'd found it in the sixth store he'd tried, a dingy used bookshop downtown on Wabash Avenue. It was an old, loose-spined hardback called Make Your Own Whirly Good Gigs and Weather Vanes. A previous owner had penciled tiny masculine-looking notes in the margins. Brent wondered where the man was at this moment and tried to imagine him from his handwriting. He saw a balding head and glasses. Strange, he thought, that they would never recognize each other if they met. He flipped ahead to a whirligig of a man milking a cow. He'd read only the chapter on supplies. He knew he should have tried building one in Chicago, but he hadn't. Once his probation officer convinced Brent's parents that the trip might help him, he'd been in a rush to leave. He eyed his blue backpacker's pack on the rack and felt separate from all the other passengers. 
Their luggage held shirts and pants. His held slabs of plywood, a saw, a hand drill, dowels, brass rods, pliers, a quart of varnish, nails, paint. He watched his pack closely, dreading his tools spilling out. He'd probably be accused of making bombs. He imagined replying with the truth that he was a builder of whirligigs. Why not? No one knew anything about him. Here was a chance not simply to alter his past, as he'd done in school, but to actually live a different life. He tried out the words in his head. I'm a traveling whirligig maker. It was an interim identity tied to his previous life. He would cast it off soon, but in favor of what? He was lodged in his own chrysalis, but had no idea what he was turning into. They passed through Preston, then Issaquah. The old man next to Brent was still sleeping. In 24 hours, they hadn't exchanged 10 words. He observed two women in front of him exclaiming over wallet photos and marveled at how naturally some people spun lines of connection, turning a world of strangers into family. He opened his own wallet, took out Leah's picture, and studied it in solitude. He found her entrancing. She looked Hawaiian, her skin the color of cinnamon, smooth as sanded wood, her forehead high, her hair long and straight. Her eyes were faintly Asian. He probed the photo for new information and now saw that she'd drawn her hair, shiny and black as obsidian, to the side with a clip her dress was white, or was it only a blouse? He examined the pattern embroidered on the bodice. She wore a gold necklace, fine as a spider's silk, but he couldn't see what hung from it. He scrutinized her smile from close range, almost felt her breath on his face. Strange to think she was now smiling at her killer. Yet she wasn't. Her head was turned at an angle. He stared into her cheerful brown eyes, knowing she would never look back at him, but always off to the side. This was a relief. Her direct gaze would have vaporized him with accusation. He turned the photo over and read her full name. Leia Rosalia Santos Zamora. Written in her mother's curly-cued script, She'd given him the picture as a model for the whirligigs, along with a disposable camera. Strangely, she wanted photos of them, but didn't want to know their locations. The idea of coming up on one, she told him, wristed or va vandalized, or fallen over lifeless like her daughter was too forbidding. She preferred to see them in her mind, where they could spin forever, safe from all harm. Suburbs appeared out the window. Then the bus nosed its way through a long tunnel and emerged into downtown Seattle. The streets were hilly. Brent glimpsed Puget Sound. He wanted a longer view, but the bus turned, following its usual labyrinthine path to the station. He glanced at his United States map. Interstate 90 ended here, the same road that led all the way back to Chicago that passed a few miles from his house. <clears throat> he felt himself a departing sailor, leaving the sight of land behind. The bus found the station, the brake sighed. He grabbed his pack and climbed down. His voice sounded odd in his ears when he asked for directions to the water. He tightened down his sleeping bag, struggled into his pack, and set off staggering like a grizzly walking upright. It was early in July and sunny. He sampled the air, amazed at how light it felt, so different from the weighted, humid heat he was used to. He followed bustling Stewart Street, viewing the cars and pedestrians curiously. How like the afterlife it all was. A populous city reached only after a long journey toward the setting sun. 
here all along, but never seen until now. Was Leia here somewhere? Walking on, he jerked at the sight of a face vaguely resembling hers, then arrived at tourist-thronged Pike Place Market. He passed up the chance for a squid burger, bought two hot dogs instead, and watched a juggler while he ate. The crowds bothered him. It felt more like Chicago than the pristine Pacific Northwest he'd heard of. He left, following signs to Waterfront Park. This turned out to be piers and amusements. He looked over the water and ambulance. A line of blue mountains floated above the clouds in the distance. That was the Washington he wanted. Leia's mother hadn't specified where in the four states he should put the whirly gigs. He bought a map and some groceries, walked back to the station, and took the next bus north. He got off in Mount Vernon and poured over his map. He broke his promise to his parents not to hitchhike, found a ride with a fisherman heading west, then walked three miles to a state park on the water only to find that the campground was full. He hadn't realized it was the 4th of July weekend. Seeing that he'd walked, the stranger suggested uh, the stranger, the ranger, suggested he try asking if he could share a site. Slowly, Brent meandered through the campground. Every site was a separate country. Baseball blaring from a radio in one, while the next was occupied by a couple playing duets on soprano recorders. It struck him that every family was a universe with its own peculiar natural laws. Free of his own family, he imagined himself part of each one he passed, trying on identities like a quick change artist. He neared the end of the campground. He paused, stealthily eyeing a bearded man unloading his tent from a bicycle. He was tall, fit, looked to be in his 30s, had a thoughtful, sunburned face. The man noticed him, stopped, and turned. Brent felt like a stray dog begging scraps. I was wondering, his voice was rested from disuse. He cleared his throat. I if you'd mind, if you picked out a corner for yourself, be my guest. I'll pay half the fee, Brent added quickly. No need. Glad to have the company. The site was on the water and more private than most. Brent was pleased. He took off his pack, pried off his sneakers, waded in up to his calves, and washed his face in Puget Sound. It was too late to begin on the whirly gig. He pulled out his tent to an open tube of plastic meant to hang from a rope strung between two trees. He'd been sent to a camp for a week a few times, but not lately, and had never camped out on his own. He stood with his rope unable to find flat ground furnished with properly spaced trees. He hoped the cyclist wasn't watching him and saw the man's dome tent suddenly spring up like a magician's illusion. Brent scanned the sky. It didn't look like rain. He put the tent back and unrolled his sleeping bag. And what brings you here? The cyclist asked over dinner. They collaborated on the fire. Brent stirred his pan of beef and barley soup. Just seeing the country, he answered offhandedly. What about you? Riding south from Canada, heading down the coast to San Francisco, seeing the country, like yourself, studying the strange customs of the natives. No offense meant. Where are you from? Prince George, British Columbia, halfway up toward the Yukon. The name raised visions of the far north in Brent's mind. He'd never met a Canadian before and felt like an explorer who's just heard tell of an unknown continent. Ever played Go? The man asked. The game? Never heard of it. Like to learn? After dinner, the cyclist produced a folding board and two tiny boxes of stones, black and white. 
It's from China originally, like most things. I'm still learning myself. Brought a, brought a book about it to study on the trip. He gave Brent the white stones, shaped like flying saucers, polished and identical. Supposed to be excellent training for generals. Some say it won the Vietnam War for the North. Wheaties for the brain. He explained the rules and they began a practice game. The object was to secure a territory arranging groups of stones into living communities that couldn't be extinguished by your opponent. Brent felt he was practicing constructing his new life. Out of nowhere, the word caress came to mind from the Vonnegut book he'd read in English, a term for a disparate group of people linked together without their knowledge. Your family and Finns, friends weren't part of your caress. You couldn't choose its members and might never know who was in it or what its purpose was. Brent felt certain that Leia was a member of his. Was the cyclist part of it too? Sunset flared orange on the water. Firecrackers began going off. Ah, yes, said the man. Noise making devices to dispel evil spirits on an important day. Brent couldn't reveal why he shared the same distance perspective. This second time around, he saw everything from the outside. Much that he'd taken for granted before now struck him as curious. Handshaking, the Pledge of Allegiance, neckties on men, sports teams named for animals. The sky shifted to shades from the spectrum's outer edges, then went black. The cyclist lit a tiny gas lamp that hissed and glowed like a shard from a star. By its light, they played another hour, then retired. Brent climbed into his sleeping bag. Radios, firecrackers, voices subsided, replaced by the churring of crickets, a breeze's passage through the trees, the waves, steady respiration. The non-human world was emerging a world he'd rarely noticed, another hidden city. Was Leia now a citizen here? He wondered if the creature he'd heard creeping over dry leaves could be her. He imagined her fully fluent here, able to hear and comprehend what he couldn't, her sense of smell greatly magnified, this bit of shoreline known to her as it never would be to him. He looked up at the stars, glinting silently, a movie without a soundtrack. Or was he simply deaf to their music? He realized he knew no constellations. Likewise, the names of trees, flowers, rocks, birds, insects, fish. He was a foreigner here. He wished he knew some names. When he awoke, the cyclist was just leaving. It was cold. Brent's bag was damp with dew, huddling within, waiting for the sun to top the trees and warm the world. He understood why people had worshipped it. Two hours later, he'd taken a shower, breakfasted on French bread and cheese, skimmed three chapters of the Whirligig book, and picked the simplest project offered, an angel whose spinning arms played a harp. He stood at the diagrams apprehensively. Neither he nor his father was the popular mechanics type. There were practically no tools in his house. Those he'd brought with him had all been bought new. It had been four years since he'd taken wood shop, where he'd spent weeks on a simple hinge, hinged top box. Maybe he'd changed in that time. He felt Leia and Mrs. Samora watching him and hoped that he had. He walked to his pack. He brought four pieces of plywood, one foot by two feet, marine grade, half an inch thick. He drew one out, sat at the table, and sketched the angel's outline on it. Then erased it all. Freehand drawing was not his forte either. Oh, Casey, Denisha!
Okay, so freehand drawing was not his forte either. It took half an hour to get it right. He tightened the wood down to the table with a clamp, started in with his D-shaped coping saw, and promptly broke the thin blade. He inserted the only spare he'd brought, feeling like a soldier down to his last bullet. He worked gingerly. The blade survived. The file that followed the same path not only smoothed the wood's edge, but snapped off a sizable chunk of the angel's wing. He slammed the file in onto the table. He hated wood. He took a break, frightened by his anger in the face of this setback. There was no channel ch changer here. He picked up the Whirly Gig book and stared at the previous owner's patient, precise script. He almost felt the man was with him, telling him to settle down and conquer the project calmly, step by step. He sat down. He decided to do without the wing. The figure could simply be a harp player. The harp was full-sized, the sort you'd find in an orchestra. Leia had played in an orchestra. He wondered what her instrument was. He sawed off the rest of the wing, sanded the wood, then went to his pack and dug out his five tubes of acrylic paint. In the trash can, he found a styrofoam cup, which he filled with water for cleaning his brushes. From the same source, he retrieved a paper plate to use as a palette. He painted one side of the figure, let it dry a bit, then leaned it on a stone and painted the other, making her hair black rather than the yellow prescribed by the book. Down one side, he printed Leia's name with a black permanent marker, then used it in his tape measure to draw the harp strings. He considered his work. It wasn't perfect, especially the outline of the face. It looked nothing like her picture. He repainted the mouth, but only made matters worse. The two sides should have been identical, but weren't. It was the best he could do. He stopped and ate lunch. All afternoon was spent on Leia's propeller-shaped arms. He began referring to the whirligig by her name and almost felt he was reassembling her broken body, reviving her. Each arm required much whittling and sanding. Suddenly, he was halted by the strangeness of his task. He saw it as his parents had. Why am I doing this? He said aloud. The whole enterprise seemed taken from a dream, incomprehensible in the light of day. He returned to work. What he knew without question was that it felt good to be busy toiling in atonement, to direct his feelings outward through his arms and knife as if draining an abscess. Now and then his eyes crossed Puget Sound to the Olympic range and settled on the peak the cyclist had told him was Mount Olympus. The home of the Greek gods, Brent mused. Hadn't Hercules likewise performed his labors to cleanse himself of a crime? From Miss Lifton's class in his previous life, the story returned to him while he worked of the Greek hero slaying his wife and children in a fit of insanity, his asking an oracle how he could atone, her telling him to seek out a certain king and perform for him twelve labors. His tasks had been just as bizarre as Brent's and likewise had called for long journeys. Brent worked until late. He cut his hand three different times and suspected that part of him wasn't content with the labors he'd been assigned and longed to mete out more punishment. He laid out the whirligig's various parts and set them shining with a thick coat of varnish. Leia's eyes glistened as if she'd awakened. Finally, he put down his tools, built a fire, and warmed another can of soup. <coughs> He returned to work early the next morning, bent over his book like a biblical scholar, mumbling, 
rereading, receiving sudden insights, he carefully mounted the arms on the figure. The placement was tricky. He tried to figure out why one arm didn't spin and adjusted it endlessly. Next, he agonized over the figure's pivot point, marked the spot, drilled the hole, and hoped for the best. He pounded some tubing into the hole. He slipped this over a piece of dowel. The figure turned smoothly from side to side. He glued the dowel into a chunk of two by four he found along the shore. He tingled. He realized he was finished. He blew upon it. The arms pinwheeled, seeming to strum the harp strings. He could hardly believe it actually worked. He blew 50 more times for confirmation. He now wondered where to set it up. Huh, was it legal to mount it on state land? Then again, the park belonged to the public. Better here than in someone's front yard. He'd have to hope the harpist so charmed the rangers that they wouldn't remove it. How to mount it was a further problem. He hadn't brought 10-foot poles in his pack. He paced the site, deliberating. Then he spied a tree limb, roughly horizontal, open to the wind from the west, and high enough to keep his work out of reach. He climbed out and nailed down the driftwood mount. Then he returned for the whirligig. Back on the ground, he stared up at it. The harp player was just over a foot tall and seemed much smaller from a distance. Brent awaited a breeze until his neck ached. When it came, the figure felt it first. It swung on the dowel like a weather vane. The arms lifted, then trembled, then spun. He felt the breeze. The arms gained speed. His smile widened. The phrase, the breath of life, traveled through his mind. He watched, mesmerized. Then he ran for the camera. And that's the end of the third chapter of Whirling Gig by Paul Fleischman. That was called The Afterlight. Hello, Casey Crawford and Denisha and Blue Sky. Hello, everyone. Okay, now Sandy's been here since the beginning. So that was in chapter one of the book, the young man tried to commit suicide by running his car off the road. Then we switched to a chapter were two young girls, two teenagers, that I think they were in the eighth grade, found themselves at a whirly gig visualizing a boyfriend for one of the girls. This chapter picks up after the car accident. Brent was not killed. However, he did kill an 18-year-old girl named Leah Samora. And his mo her mother tasked him as his restitution for killing her daughter. She gave him the task of going to Washington, California, Florida, and Maine, the four corners of the United States, to build whirly gigs that look like her, her daughter because her daughter brought smiles to everyone's faces when she was alive. And she loved whirly gigs when she was a little girl. So that was our first introduction to the whirly gigs by, from Brent. But this one was in Washington. Remember the girls last time were in Maine. So he had already, Washington was the first one but somehow we had already jumped to Maine. So anyway, really, really, really good, good story. And I've read ahead. Huh? I've read ahead 
And it, this is really a good book. It's an excellent story. It started out very strange. But next we go to Miami, Florida. So he goes from Washington to Florida. What happened to California? Anyway, I would have gone Washington, California, Florida, and then Maine, and then back to Chicago. But, you know, that's me. <laughs> anyway, the the mother, Leia's mother, gave um, Brent a 45-day bus pass. So he has to do all of this in 45 days. Interesting, right? Very interesting. So how is everybody today? It is uh, almost 8 o'clock here in what is now dark, Middle Tennessee. Um, yeah, I've been furiously getting ready for um, craft fair. Um, I've had some medical issues this week, but... Uh, Stephanie, hi, Stephanie. That's all right, Stephanie, you can see the replay. I think about 30 minutes to an hour after we close the session, it's up for you to be able to listen to the whole chapter on the on the YouTube channel. So if those of you that missed, um, those of you who missed the reading, you can go back and listen to it after it, after it loads up on to the channel. Um, thank you, Blue Sky. Anyway, I had some medical issues. Things are panning out. Um, and I have a craft fair next, this coming Saturday from 9 to 4. In Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, so, yeah, it's called the Fall Pop. I'm putting it in the Pop Up Market in Murfreesboro. So, I, um, Blue Sky, I make um, children's toys and clothing, um, hats, mommy and me hats, uh, the little sleep sacks. I made a um, caterpillar, very hungry caterpillar, you know, all the different colors. I made a very hungry caterpillar sleep sack with um, the little hat that has the little antenna on it. Very cute. Do I play Fortnite? I don't know what that is, Casey. What is Fortnite? Thank you for the prayers. I do appreciate the prayers. I really do. Um, anyway, so that's kind of what's going on here in my house. Nothing spectacular, just busy, busy. Trying to stay busy and out of trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Denisha. Oh, you're Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Well, thank you, Blue Sky. Um, I make fingerless gloves. I ha I do make mittens, but not gloves with the fingers. They take too much time. And then you can buy them real inexpensively at Walmart. So, yeah, but I did make some loveys. I'm working on my fourth lovey, which it has the little uh, stuffed animal head and sometimes the arms and then the little blanket for the little toddler to carry around. They're just the right size for toddlers. Um, I will. I'll do that sometime. I also have um, a channel over. Um, I have another YouTube channel. That's basically for my um, for my crafts. And let's see if I can go there. I bet I can't because I'm on this one. Just 
just a sec. I'll put the, the link for my crochet channel um, in the description. Thank you, Casey. Yay, crochet, Denisha. <laughs> All right, you guys. Anybody have any questions for me? Oh, sorry, Daniel. All right, well, I'm going to do the blessing then. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his hands upon you and grant you his peace. Um, my channel is DM's Handcrafts. Until next time, everybody, have a good rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday.